And since um, nobody's uh, leaving right now, uh, John, if you could help, uh, we have the booklets out here and we have a little larger crowd than we typically wouldn't hear. So maybe one per family, uh, if you like the notes on, on Islam and Christianity. And so what we do, we show a video here first of all, and uh, this gentleman does a, a good job at explaining things. And so uh, with that, after we watch the video, we'll come back up, kind of key in a few things, but we also open up for discussion. Maybe you've had experience. I know some have for sure. And uh, others may uh, have had uh, just experience with uh, witnessing to someone of the Muslim is Islamic faith, uh, but then also just um, how do we as Christians then uh, demonstrate Christ to others? So there's some key things that we need to take away from this as well, and uh, I think that's something of importance. So uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, play this video here, and uh, am I in control of that, or are you guys control that up there? You're in control of it? I am. Okay, I'm in control. Here we go. I'm the most out of control, in control guy right now because <laughs> learning how to do this stuff is uh, new to me, so uh, bear with me if I make a mistake here. And so uh, I'll, I'll let John go ahead and get that uh, passed out. You can kind of follow along in there. Some of the information may be redundant when we get into discussion, but uh, repetition is the key to learning, and so I think it'll help all of us just to have that information as well. And so, uh, all right, let's go ahead and get this started. We now turn to the subject of Islam. I think it's very safe to say that very few religious movements in our time have inspired the same combination of fascination and fear that we find in Islam. Islam means submission. Muslim means one who submits. And it would be wise, I think, for us to begin with a brief overview of the life of Muhammad, who is according to Islam, the Muslim par excellence. He was born in AD 570 in Mecca, Arabia, to a poor family. Mecca at that time was a center for trading and a center for polytheistic worship. The tribes from all around would come and pay their respects to the deities in what was called the Kaaba, a large black squarish structure that still exists to this day. Muhammad became a merchant, and in his dealings with those traveling through Mecca, and in his own travels, he came into contact with Judaism, with Christianity in a number of forms, including heretical forms, and other religions of his day. The turning point of his life came in AD 610, when he found himself in a cave, in meditation, and was confronted by the angel Gabriel, who commanded him to recite. According to the account, Muhammad was overwhelmed by the sight of this angelic being. And Gabriel continued to insist that he recite until the point at which Muhammad was seized by a supernatural power and compelled to recite to begin to speak. And this, in fact, is the origin of the Quran, which means recitation. The encounter with Gabriel was so disturbing to Muhammad that he thought that he had been demon-possessed. But his wife at the time, his senior wife, encouraged him to continue these encounters, to go with it. And he did. After his initial contact with the angel Gabriel, Muhammad began his career as the chosen prophet of Allah. The years that followed were a saga of persecution, retribution, and revelation. At one point, in AD 621, supposedly Gabriel took Muhammad 
on a magical steed on his night journey, in a single night traveling not only to Jerusalem, but to heaven itself. But the turning point for Muhammad in his prophethood was in A.D. 622, was the Hijra, his journey to Medina, which actually is the beginning of the Muslim calendar. And Muslims mark time from that point forward, much as Christians begin their calendars with A.D., Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. There were struggles with the other political and social powers of his day. And finally, Muhammad conquered Mecca. He entered in power, he entered in force, and he cleansed the Kaaba of the hundreds of idols that were the center for pagan worship there and dedicated it to Allah. Muhammad died in AD 632, and his passing eventually set off a struggle for succession, which split Islam into the two main groups that dominate today, the Sunnis and the Shias, but we'll talk about that later. Now there are 1.2 billion Muslims scattered about the world, but especially in North Africa, in the Middle East, and South Asia. What are the scriptures and guiding documents of Islam? First and foremost, the Quran. Quran means recitation, and it's composed of 114 surahs, or chapters, composed over 22 years. His followers would record his sayings on palm fronds, bits of parchment, rocks, and so forth, and commit them to memory. The surahs of the Quran are arranged in roughly decreasing order of length. There's no narrative, as you would find in Genesis or Exodus or the Gospels or Acts. The Quran that we have today is said to be a copy of an eternal tablet in heaven. And Muslims regard the Quran with utmost respect. Of course, it was originally given in Arabic. If you find a copy in English, the title will make it very clear that the book is not the Quran itself, only something intended to convey the message of the Quran, because the Quran is only in Arabic, and no translation, supposedly, can reveal its fullness and perfection. It's very interesting that even Muslims in countries where Arabic is not spoken, even Muslims who barely know the language, will often memorize the entire book, which is roughly the length of the New Testament. The Quran physically is treated with enormous respect, fanatical respect. Very often, Muslims will never hold the Quran below the waist. When they put it away, they will wrap it in a lovely cloth. They will put it on the highest shelf in the home. And this attitude will give you an idea of why, when there's even been an accusation or a suspicion that a physical copy of the Quran has been abused or somehow desecrated, it can result in rioting depending on who has been accused of the offense. They claim that the Quran is perfect and uncorrupted, unlike the Bible, which they consider to be a faulty document. It's interesting. Like the Mormons, the Muslims like to appeal to the Bible as a basis for their legitimacy and authority. They like to appeal to it as a precedent to talk about the prophets that came before Muhammad and uh, say that he is part of a continuity, when in fact, they turn right around and say that the Bible has been corrupted, is not really trustworthy, and uh, it's difficult to have it both ways. But this is the Muslim position. The Quran contains many references to Bible characters and events. For example, in the Quran, it was not Isaac whom Abraham was going to sacrifice on the mountain. It was Ishmael. Along with the Quran, there is uh, a body of teaching drawn from the Sunnah. This means path, composed of the Hadith. This means narrative, commentaries on the acts of Muhammad, as reported by his companions, and the Sirah, which are traditional biographies of Muhammad. If you want to know the teachings of Islam, you need to look through the Quran, the Hadith, and the Sirah. The majority of Muslims affirm six beliefs, first and foremost being belief in Allah. Allah is 
the standard generic Arabic word for God, but of course in Islam it takes on a special quality and has a very specific meaning. Allah is a singular unity. He is only one person. He's a divine being with no counterparts, no sons, as the Muslims state quite emphatically, of course with reference to Christian claims about Jesus. The Muslim position on God is somewhat similar to what we find in Arianism, which uh, has its modern counterpart with the Jehovah's Witnesses. God in Islam is not a father. To the Muslim, the term father in reference to God is somehow suggestive of paternity in a more literal sense and is very offensive. And Islam and the Quran misrepresent the Christian view of God as being the Father, the Son, and Mary. So if you find yourself locked in some controversy with a Muslim about who God is according to Christianity, understand that their holy book has inaccurately represented what you believe. And this can be a very difficult hurdle to overcome. Perhaps the gravest sin in all of Islam is shirk, which means the sin of association. It is the worst and said to be unpardonable. It is to associate Allah with anything. I said that he has no counterparts, no sons. According to the Quran, Allah does not beget, is not begotten. He has no partners, he has no equals. And tawhid is the Muslim concept expressing the absolute oneness, not only of Allah, but of his will. You must understand that in Islam, not only is Allah absolute in one, but everything is to be absolutely under the control of, under subjection to Allah. Everyone, everywhere, everything. That is the ideal toward which Muslims are working. This ideal of Tawheed. That's the first belief. The second belief is in all of Allah's prophets and messengers, foremost, of course, being none other than Muhammad. He's said to be the seal of the prophets, the last of the greatest. Anytime you see Muhammad's name written in English, materials by Muslims, typically you will find the initials PBUH, peace be upon him. Anytime Muhammad's name is given, even spoken, this peace be upon him, this expression of respect follows immediately. Muhammad is said to be the greatest man who ever lived. Our highest example in both word and deed. <coughs> it's difficult for Christians to appreciate, even Christians who ask themselves regularly and wear little armbands that say, what would Jesus do? The daily concern of every observant Muslim is, what would Muhammad do? From the time your eyes open in the morning until they close at night, the man in all of his habits, all of his expressions, to a degree that you would find perhaps fascinating, perhaps astonishing, is to be observed as how we should live. Because in the end, it's all about Muhammad. And I will talk about that in a bit. The Muslims, in their own way, have a high regard for Jesus. They classify him as a major prophet, one of 124,000 since Adam, including Abraham, Noah, Moses, and David. They claim that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he was a very great teacher, that he was a man of righteousness, that uh, he was a worker of miracles. They deny outright, however, that he was God that he was crucified. But they do say that he ascended and is expected to return. The view of Jesus in the Quran is confusing, but it does give you some traction in talking about who he really is, what he has come to do. The third principal belief of Muslims is in angels. It's taught that each person has two angels assigned to him, one to record the person's good deeds, 
the other to record the bad deeds. There's also a belief in demons and in a class of being called jinn. This is where we get our English word genie. Uh, these are spirit beings that were made from fire. Muslims also believe, number four, in the holy books, above all the Quran, but also, as I indicated a bit earlier, they have a degree of respect for the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, the Psalms, and the Gospels. But they claim that all of these have been abrogated, and abrogation is a key word in Islam. They have been abrogated, they've been superseded. Muslims believe that they were for the time in which they were given, but only then, and that the Quran, the perfect book, has come. These other books are of very limited value and really not to be relied upon. Fifth, Muslims affirm their belief in the day of judgment and the resurrection. Each person's deeds will be weighed in the balance. Those whose good deeds outweigh their bad deeds will be rewarded with paradise. Those whose bad deeds outweigh the good will be judged to hell. No one can know in advance what Allah will do. There is no assurance of salvation in Islam, except perhaps for those who give their lives in righteous jihad. And sixth, Muslims affirm their belief in destiny, in fate. Now along with these six beliefs, Muslims affirm five pillars, five obligations. The first of these is the profession of faith, the shahada. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. A single honest recitation of this statement, this shahada in Arabic, is all that is required for a person to become a Muslim. Well, you will see a calligraphic representation of the shahada on the flag of Saudi Arabia, that green flag with a white writing, the sword underneath. That is the declaration, the profession of faith, that is the first pillar of Islam. The second pillar is that of prayers, salat. Prayers are performed five times daily, at dawn, at noon, afternoon, sunset, and nightfall. Facing Mecca, always facing Mecca. An earlier revelation had told Muhammad that he was to face Jerusalem. After some incidents with some Jews, this was changed. Muslims face Mecca when they pray. Prayers are preceded by ritual washing, ablutions. And in addition to the five daily prayers, Muslims also engage in congregational prayers on Fridays. These are obligatory for Muslim man. The third pillar is almsgiving to the poor and needy, zakat. Generally, it's equal to 2.5% of the individual's wealth accumulated during the year. Fourth is psalm, fasting during the month of Ramadan. No eating, drinking, smoking, or sexual intercourse from sunrise to sunset. And some people do say it is a mark of the commitment of Muslims who in Middle Eastern countries in 140 degree weather refuse to take a drop of liquid during the daylight hours of fasting during Ramadan. The fifth pillar is the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca. Every able-bodied Muslim is expected, if at all possible, to personally go to Mecca and participate in the rituals that take place there and usually consume about a week of time. It's quite a spectacular undertaking, millions of people descending on Mecca for the Hajj. Uh, it's interesting, especially because these Muslims from every part of the earth are required to take off their national dress and to wear a very, very simple white costume that eliminates all distinctions of race, of class, of things that would ordinarily distinguish people from one another. There's a tremendous sense of brotherhood among the Muslims who take part in the Hajj. For most, it's the highlight of their lives. The Muslims also have a belief, of course, in salvation. There's no concept of original sin in Islam as we have in Christianity. The Muslims believe that Adam disobeyed Allah, but no original sin was passed down to us. The idea is that humans are frail, they're weak, they're prone to temptation, ignorance and forgetfulness, but not predisposed to sin. 
The solution is obedience through repentance and human effort. Islam has produced vast, extensive, detailed lists of rules for Muslims to observe. Many, many, many of them based on the life of Muhammad. But as I said before, there is no assurance of salvation possible apart from dying in righteous jihad. I need to make a clarification. There are said to be two kinds of jihad. What's called the greater jihad, which is the struggle within oneself to uh, live a righteous life. And then the lesser jihad, which is essentially holy war in defense of Islam. The distinction is important. Islam has generated many, many sects, but the three major expressions are Sunni Islam, Shia Islam, and Sufism. The Sunnis, after the death of Muhammad, favored electing a successor, and they prevailed. They're consensus-oriented. They emphasize the Sunnah as the guiding set of documents for the practice of the faith. They're by far in the majority. There are about a billion of them worldwide. The next most familiar to most Westerners are the Shiites. They favored the idea that a blood relative of Muhammad should be his successor. And the struggle, they lost. But uh, they still hold sway over many millions of people, particularly in Iran and in neighboring countries. Whereas the Sunni are more consensus-oriented, the Shia are very authority-oriented, as illustrated in uh, the Ayatollahs of Iran. The third major group are the Sufis, who number about 240 million worldwide. This is the mystical side of Islam. Have you ever seen a photograph or an illustration of men wearing a fez, uh, that semi-conical cap with a tassel on top, it's red, and they're wearing garments that spread out as they move about in a, in a twirling fashion. Those are the whirling dervishes, and they are perhaps the best known symbol of Sufism, which strives for a mystical union with God. There are other expressions and realities of Islam. There's folk Islam, which is quite common throughout the developing world. It's Islam, it's the religion of the Quran and the Sunnah, combined with local traditions, superstitions, uh, means of appeasing spirits, use of magical objects. I need to make a very important distinction, especially because of the times in which we live. A distinction between what we might call mainstream Islam, Islamism, and jihadism. According to Mary Habeck of Johns Hopkins University, Islamism is the religion of roughly 20% of Muslims worldwide. It started early in the 20th century. It's been said that there is a lot of resentment among Muslims. And when you look at some of the history of the last couple hundred years, you can begin to appreciate why. From Napoleon's conquest of Egypt up until the end of World War I, almost every majority Muslim country in the world, except for Turkey, came under the domination of Europe. This was deeply humiliating, and I believe a catalyst for Islamism. The main characteristic of Islamism is the belief that Islam must have political power and state control in order to be correctly implemented. Remember about Tawheed, that Allah is to have control over everyone, everything, everywhere. And the vast majority of Islamists support some kind of gradual social and political process to achieve their ends. But we also have the jihadists. According to Mary Habeck, the best way to characterize jihadism is as a radical version of Islamism which believes that only violence will allow the creation of the perfect Islamic state. Most importantly, they argue that democracy isn't just wrong, it's in direct contradiction to Tawheed. In this belief system, anyone who supports democracy becomes an infidel and should be killed. Second, jihadists recognize only one version of Islamic law, Sharia, is correct. And they state that any Muslim who doesn't follow their variety of Sharia 
is not only a sinner, but also a non-believer, effectively a non-Muslim. And finally, jihadists have vowed eternal violence and hatred toward all non-Muslims, as they define them, until the entire world is ruled by their version of Islamic law. There are a number of offshoots and related groups to Islam. For example, the Baha'i world faith, with about 5 million followers, which began in Iran in 1844, which was started by the Bab and Baha'u'llah. There's the Ahmadiyya movement, which began in Pakistan in 1889, and the Nation of Islam, founded in 1930 by Wallace Fard in the United States, but which is Muslim in name only. It's actually a bizarre polytheistic system that bears very little resemblance to Islam once you get beyond the surface. Has uh, anyone in here ever had the privilege of witnessing to, in a good dialogue, with someone uh, from the Islamic faith? You have? Okay. You have? Okay. I had the privilege many years ago of leading to Christ a young man about my same age. I was about 20 years old. He might have been a couple years older than me. I was on the streets of Chicago passing out tracts. And uh, he was one that came up to me, very kind gentleman. He said he was, he didn't say that he was uh, Muslim, but he said that he was studying it. And yet, with that, we had a very interesting dialogue. And I asked him what was the appeal to him, and, and uh, we went back and forth just standing there on the sidewalk in Chicago. <clears throat> and to make a long story short, um, he expressed to me, uh, knowing that internally he was not uh, content, he knew there was something still missing, even in all his studies. And I, don't, I can't remember exactly how much he was engrossed in it, uh, but it was enough where he had questions about, will I actually know uh, that I'll be accepted by Allah? And the answer to that is no, you never know if you're fully accepted. And if you heard this gentleman speak, unless you commit jihad and you're guaranteed then a place uh, in heaven. So with that, uh, we understand that um, it is, is difficult to come to a place where you feel confident uh, that you have a position uh, with uh, Allah, but yet this uh, man that I had spoken to sweetly bowed his head there with me after I explained what sin was and understanding, and he got, he got the concept, no problem, uh, but he did trust Christ as his Savior, and it was just a sweet smile come over his face, and he just said, thank you so much for explaining this to me, and I uh, never saw him again after that, and I don't know what happened, but uh, it was just a sweet exchange, and so you, you just never know. Uh, again, he was one who was a student. He was trying to figure out where he stood, but he was very knowledgeable, and so with that, um, there are, of course, many thousands of Muslims who have converted to Christ, who truly trusting in Jesus Christ. Uh, there's one in this room right now. And, uh, and so uh, sometime I'd love for her to share her testimony. You can chime in anytime you want. I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, uh, if uh, at any time you want to uh, interject something, we'd be happy to hear from you because we know that you have uh, grown up in this. So <clears throat> with that being stated, uh, just a couple things to kind of go back over. And if you have a comment or a statement, please uh, share that with us at any point in this. Uh, you don't have to just listen to me talk the whole time, but I did stop it at this point because I wanted to just kind of, with that information in our head, uh, if you were to attempt to speak to someone of the Muslim faith, uh, Islamic faith, um, your approach has to be very considerate of, of their position and their knowledge of, of their religion because like many people from different faiths, uh, as soon as you start bringing up Jesus Christ or you start bringing up the New Testament Bible, uh, there's an initial defense and reaction. Uh, and so many times being familiar with what uh, that faith believes is very helpful or being inquisitive. Could you explain this to me? And not in a condescending way, but in a way that is actually engaging them that you're interested in learning about them and learning about their faith. Because for any of us, if somebody was treating you like you knew they didn't agree and they just, well, why'd you do that? Or why would you say that? Or why, why would you think that? Well, most of us can have a defense mechanism towards that. And so with uh, people of, uh, who have grown up and been very much entrenched in their particular belief system, it is imperative that you uh, talk to them uh, with genuine interest. Uh, and even though your desire is to teach them the truth about Jesus Christ, 
if you start with that, it's, it's a non-starter. Uh, most likely you're going to be shut down and the conversation can be over rather quickly. If you ask them questions, can you explain this about me? I, I, I've heard a little bit, I don't know much about your faith, but I, I know that it was started by Muhammad. You know, what is your view of him? That's going to tell you a lot about their knowledge and also about their belief. Now, like many of us growing up Roman Catholic, uh, I could quote you the stuff from Roman Catholicism. Now, did I really believe it or was it just something that I was just taught so much that I just heard it so much that it was just part of me? That's true in every religion. That's even true in our own church. There are ki our kids growing up, they've heard this, but have they ever put their faith and trust personally in Jesus Christ? And sometimes we don't know that until we watch their life and see that, man, there's no fruit in their life as being a Christian, even though they pray to prayer, they've been in Sunday school, they attend all the preaching meetings, but something's not changed in their life. Something doesn't demonstrate the fruit of Jesus Christ. And so every parent here should take note of their own kids regarding Christianity, uh, but then also we consider that with those that we would speak to. Um, anything of the five pillars, uh, if you need that uh, in your booklet, it's in there, uh, stand out to you as far as what what these mean and what they represent to them as far as what they believe. So we have the confessing uh, of their faith. Uh, we have the prayer, the fasting, giving of alms, and the pilgrimage to Mecca. What does that say about people uh, of the Islamic faith or Muslim beliefs? What's that? The dedication level, absolutely, and, and it's a dedication level that some of us are not familiar with growing up perhaps in Christian homes, and I could say in my community where I grew up, it was very much Irish Catholic and um, uh, Italian Catholic. Uh, they were in it, <laughs> and uh, they, uh, it was just one of those things that just everyone kind of knew. There was a, there, that idea of a brotherhood, if you would, that everyone just knew what was going to happen either Saturday night or Sunday morning. Uh, it was just the whole community was geared that way. And so when you're in that community, boy, that's a hard thing to just think, okay, that's already, that's done uh, if you convert to Christianity. Uh, so not only that, but then uh, we, we see that commitment level by people, again, whether or not they're fully understanding, uh, like Catholicism in one respect, there's never that full uh, belief that you're accepted by God or by Allah. You're, there's always that question mark. There's never that uh, fullness of knowing for sure. There's also that I've got to keep doing to be accepted. I've got to keep obeying the laws. I have to keep doing good. I have to uh, keep all the moral laws. And you're never fully confident uh, of where you'll be. Same thing for when I was practicing Roman Catholicism. It was, do you ever know for sure? Well, no, just keep being a good Catholic till the day you die. And then most likely you'll be in heaven. <laughs> so it's always that ah, that's, that's not enough. And so many religions have this same concept of a works-based uh, of uh, salvation, if you, want to, if you want to call it that. And for, for uh, Muslims, it's the hope, or not even a, a true hope, it's a wish that Allah will accept them someday. And so that is something to uh, understand, that if you're going to talk to somebody about faith, ask them what their security level is. Now, they may say, as a defense mechanism, I am very secure in my faith. But if, as you get to know them more and you get to say, so how confident are you that Allah will accept you? And that usually will tell you where they're at. Also, uh, never be offensive and, and try, you know, again, obviously we don't purposely try to be offensive, but sometimes we just don't know how to say things. So ask questions instead of making statements that might insult them. If you insult Muhammad, in some cases, that's worse than insulting Allah, just depending on what group of people you're dealing with, uh, because as their belief system uh, is that he is the greatest prophet, that he is the leader, he is the one they look to. And so uh, we must understand that uh, you may uh, inadvertently or you may purposely condescend Allah or Muhammad and you have just put up a wall. Uh, so you're not gonna get any more inroad with that, that person and they're gonna mark you as someone uh, who is just uh, against them. So <clears throat> being very careful uh, in your engagement with people on this level. Prayer, um, I won't ask, but I don't know uh, how many of you, particularly men in our church, that five times a day 
you would be as committed to prayers as uh, many uh, of uh, Muslims are. Uh, and so this is something also that they are committed to this. And, and again, is it all of them? No. Like any religion, there's some that just don't take it as seriously, but there are many that if it's ingrained in them since they're a kid, it's part of their lifestyle. This is just what they do. And, uh, and sincere in, in many cases, but then in some cases, they just do it because it's expected. Uh, so uh, that's, that's uh, something uh, that we understand. Fasting, um, even though it may not be something that we say is a command, uh, fasting is a part of their uh, religious observance, is one of the five uh, pillars. Uh, and that's something also that it is good for Christians to practice fasting. Uh, you can fast for health reasons, which I know many people do that. Others, for just dedicating yourself to a time of prayer and seeking God's face and, and asking Him for wisdom or just spending time alone, worshiping, praising God and just avoiding, you know, skipping a meal or two or some for days. I've been on many fasts uh, just to have a sensitivity towards God. And that's a good thing for us to practice as a Christian. Well, they also uh, fast and, uh, and spend that time. Giving of alms, uh, we would call it giving our giving, giving our offerings, tithing, however you want to word it. Uh, but that's something that they would also practice. And then the pilgrimage to Mecca. Now, we don't have anything like that. Now, some uh, Roman Catholics will go to Rome as part of their life and uh, make that journey. But uh, we don't have a place as Christians. You could say Jerusalem, but it's not a requirement on us to go to Jerusalem and make that journey. That's on my bucket list. I'll go someday, hopefully. If not, I'll let the Lord let me see the new Jerusalem, and that'll be great uh, someday. Uh, but that's something that we understand uh, is very important to them and those who practice that. And again, that sense of this is something we do as a good Muslim. We, we make this journey at some point in our life. And you can understand why that is important to them. Now, think about this. Someone who then converts to Christianity or a different religion gives up so much of their family heritage as some of us might experience giving up uh, Catholicism or whatever religion you came from, uh, you know, that's something that in some families you have just violated something so sacred and so core that they don't get over that. And we know I had a, I had a Hindu uh, friend who lived here in Connecticut, uh, and I've used this illustration before, his own father contracted his cousin to kill him because he converted from Hinduism to Christianity. And uh, he lived here in the United States, had a ministry to Hindus, and uh, yet he had to flee from his own family because he was next in line to be the priest of his community. And uh, because he converted to Christianity, uh, the only way he was saved was his mother lit herself on fire and told uh, another cousin, take him away, get him out there. And they had to hide him until he got to the Christian missionaries and they got him out to safety. Folks, this is real. This is, this is not that many years ago. And this is still going on today in many different faiths where you convert, you're either dead or you're dead to them uh, even though you're alive. They don't want to see you anymore. Our missionary to Israel, uh, he grew up in, in New York. Uh, when he got converted, his dad said, you are no longer my son. This is only 20, 20 years ago right here in the United States, and he's a missionary now to Israel, but his own father disowned him, and it wasn't until his, on his dad's deathbed that his dad actually uh, welcomed him in the, to, into the room, but that was it. He, he said, you're dead to me. So you, you realize that people from other religions take this so seriously, and so when people are converting, it's not just yes to Jesus, it's no to my family heritage, it's no to my culture, it's no to everything I've known, because they take it so seriously. And so when you're trying to maybe in your own way just lightly witness to somebody, they're thinking way deeper sometimes than you realize. They're, they're saying, you don't know what I'm giving up to convert to Christianity. And so we have to kind of consider and have that compassion on these people that you would say, no, nah, they're, just, they're just deceived by the devil. Okay, but this is their life. This is, this is their livelihood. This is their family. And so we must realize that this is a hard thing. So those are their... There are five pillars and, and five beliefs. Uh, obviously, as far as salvation, uh, considering that, we, we could easily just jump into the fact that um, you know, salvation is a gift that is promised to us 
uh, by God. Uh, and so if you take that tactic, and which is, which is uh, all well and fine, one of the key things for you as a Christian is not just what your words are, and you can talk about Jesus. They're not going to be upset if you talk about Jesus because they believe Jesus was a good prophet. They believe Muhammad is better, uh, but you need to understand that they look at him as a prophet. And so it's not so much that he would be the Savior. Now, you can talk to them, and as you get these opportunities, talk to them about that you do believe that, but then your life better back up the morality of Jesus Christ because that's what they're trying to do as good Muslims. They have a set of rules and laws. Now, not all Muslims are strict adherents to this, but uh, there are many that are. Uh, a pastor friend of mine who just, just passed away not too long ago was sitting in on a plane. He actually sat next to a, a gentleman, and uh, he had his Bible out, and he was reading, the, the pastor was reading his Bible. The gentleman next to him uh, took out his Quran, and, uh, and they started uh, 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 talking uh, to one another uh, and so uh, the uh, so the conversation struck up and basically the question was asked by the gentleman who was a Muslim he said um, what kind of Christian are you and uh, he said I am I am a Christian he said I'm a born-again Christian I believe that the Bible is the Word of God I believe that we are required to uh, follow this book to live this book and he goes ah he goes you're a Christian that we call of the book and he said, because we met so many of your Christians that don't live by the book. Well, guess who this guy was sitting next to him? Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, basketball player that I watched growing up. And he was a devout Muslim. And, uh, but yet, if you, this is something that you have to understand. They, true Muslims, those who actually practice their faith, have a standard. And they look at Christians and think, we understand what the West is like. We don't want that. So again... These are the stricter ones, but yet they say, if you're going to be one of the book, then you better live by that book. And they have respect for those who live by the book. Doesn't mean they want to be converted to Christ, but they have respect for you. So it is interesting that even those from different cultures uh, have this line because of what has been ingrained in them, that if you're going to speak about your God, then you better live by what they know your God says in the book. And so even if it's not their God, and so they'll have respect for you, but they still doesn't mean that they'll want to convert to Christianity. So I think that's uh, interesting. Uh, something to consider then uh, about their God compared to our God. So Allah obviously is not our God. Our God. They, they have, uh, they're monotheistic in, in the purest sense that it is only Allah. There is no Son, there is no Holy Spirit, nothing like that. So Allah is, if you would, their sovereign God. There is none other like Him. Um, and so with that, uh, He is also someone who is viewed as untouchable, uh, and using my own words here, uh, and someone who cannot be approached. And so they don't view God as the Bible describes our God. When you consider how the Bible describes our God, how does the Bible describe our God? There's a lot. Loving. What else? Father. What's, what's the other word for father that is used? Abba, daddy. Approachable. Right? We can go on and on with the scriptures of our God. That is not how they view Allah. Uh, they never know if they're accepted fully by Allah. They just hope that as they live their life and they do good and they keep the moral laws and they uh, try to be as good as they can, they, they keep the pillars, they, they live by the principles of faith, that they hope that they'll be accepted. And that is something that I think resonates with those when you get to know them enough, and this is building relationships. It might be a neighbor, it might be a co-worker. Uh, try not to offend in any way. Understand cultural taboos. Uh, if you go to a house and you see shoes outside the door, that's probably a sign that they're from a different culture in many cases, but then also it might be a religious part of that. And so if you're invited to come in, which typically you probably would not be, but if you were, honor their culture and at least learn. If you show that you're trying to honor them, uh, they'll treat that with greatest respect. <clears throat> in some of the more um, strict adherents, uh, not westernized uh, uh, Muslims, uh, men don't talk to women. 
men talk to men, women talk to women. And, and again, now that they're working out in the workforce, a lot of these rules have changed to a point, but that is common. So if you were to address the family, uh, you would address either the, the husband, if he's the head of household, or an older brother or uncle or somebody like that. For you to, as a man, to just personally strike up a conversation with the woman, unless she engaged you first, that would be uh, considered inappropriate. And again, it depends on how strict adherence they are, but these are just things that you can learn to be uh, mindful of when you're trying to witness. Listen, God has made America a great melting pot. We're getting more and more cultures are moving in. Just look around our own community in the last few years. It's happening more and more and more. Uh, learn about the cultures in our community. Learn how to embrace this, but then also learn, man, how do I try to be non-offensive as a neighbor, as a friend, as a coworker, but then looking for the opportunity just to discuss their belief systems? Uh, that would be something that would be very appropriate. I can see Jesus sitting down and talking with different people and trying to, of course he's God, but uh, in the most appropriate way, conversing with them and, and talking to them about uh, what their faith is. And then, of course, he would bring it around in a way that would uh, put them uh, in line with the truth. Well, we need to learn to practice that as well as believers who are trying to reach people with the truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that is, that is another thing that is important for us to consider as far as uh, opportunities to be able to witness to them. Um, one of the things that I think also is kind of interesting, that idea of uh, the, the angels, uh, the, you have the good angel keeping record of your good and the, and the bad angel keeping record of your bad. Uh, that is something that as I've just uh, had, have had the opportunity to speak to people from Muslim faith a few times, uh, that is something that they, uh, some live with that all the time in their mind. Some do not, just like many different uh, people that practice religion. Uh, but it is a source of knowledge to them, and if they are knowledgeable about their faith, that's a good inroad as well. Uh, you know, that if you just know that about their faith and you understand where they're coming from, uh, that might be a good uh, strategy at some point to bring up uh, a conversation about uh, their good and their bad being recorded. Why would you do that? Well, you get to a point where you see their sensitivity towards being accepted because they never feel, full, uh, feel fully accepted. Well, that's a good segue for us as believers at some point, and again, they could shut it down just like anyone else does, but to talk about your personal faith and how that because of Jesus' sacrifice and being God in the flesh, he was able to do that. Now, again, they might shut it down, but they might hear and listen and understand You've got something I don't have. Doesn't mean they want it, but it's a good starting point for them to understand. Okay, and so if they're will, if you're willing to listen to them talk about their faith, they will give you respect enough to listen to you, and let the Holy Spirit then take that those opportunities that you're talking about your Savior and what He really is. Let the Holy Spirit then use that information to, to speak to their hearts, and and that's a, a good approach for talking to people, knowing enough about their their belief system. So not to offend, but then ask them questions about that. And so uh, those are some, uh, just some good tactics that we can use uh, in order to uh, try to speak to them. All right, I've talked long enough. Anyone else have input, insight, or statements about this? Sam? Absolutely. It's, it's got to be the Holy Spirit for anyone's salvation experience, for anyone, but to get, for us to be able to get in uh, the Word of God or at least just uh, sharing with them the different perspective on faith in Christ alone and our acceptance uh, is, is a major uh, opportunity for us. And so, yeah, very good. Uh, another thing to consider is uh, what is the appeal of, of Islam. And that's something I think 
Um, some people say, why has it grown so rapidly over the last how many years? And, uh, and so we see that it has been uh, growing quite rapidly, and, and especially as uh, many people have come to the United States as well. Well, one of the things we understand is, one, <clears throat> the um, growth by force. Uh, the Catholic Church saw that uh, back during the uh, uh, 500 to 1500. Uh, basically, it was convert or die. <laughs> if, if you don't want to be a part of us, then we'll, we'll make your life miserable. Well, uh, Islam did the same thing for a period of time, and they took over places, and there was a lot of warring factions. It wasn't just them. Christians have done some heinous things in the name of, of God. Uh, and so we understand that both sides have used force for conversion. Now, I don't believe any forced conversion is true conversion, uh, but yet it, it, you know, you're scared to go against the, the ruling power. And so uh, that's something uh, of one reason uh, why many people have uh, converted and, 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 of course, growing up in that culture where that is the law and you don't violate these laws, that's obviously compelling. <clears throat> the simplicity of, of beliefs and requirements, uh, there are some people that actually like a clear-cut system of beliefs and requirements. So to have uh, six main beliefs and five pillars, okay, that makes sense. I can, I can abide by that. When you look at Christianity, uh, it, ours is not as clear cut. Why? Well, there's freedom in Christ. And that's hard sometimes. When you're, when you, there are many people that were more faithful as Catholics than they seem to be as born-again believers because, boy, when I was Catholic, I knew this was accepted, this was not accepted. Well, Similarly, the same things are true in, in true Christianity. Now it's the Spirit of God guiding you, not a whole bunch of lists of do's and don'ts. Because remember, when we were in the workspace religion, well, you've got to keep the commandments. Well, we did our best to keep them, but if, you know, if we failed, we go to the priest and ask for forgiveness. I mean, that was our out. Uh, and so the same thing with the Islamic faith. Here's the pillars, here's our six beliefs. As long as you keep these, then you're hoping that you'll be accepted. <clears throat> and so there is this idea that it's a simplistic in, in one respect, but uh, obviously for some of the more extreme, those who would practice and stick to the Sharia law, uh, seems a little more extreme as far as uh, their belief system, but yet that would be something that uh, there's structure. And there are many people that look for religion for structure in their life. They want that security of knowing, okay, I know what to do, I know what not what to do. And that gives them structure. Uh, secondly, uh, moral clarity. I know what's right and I know what's wrong. They're, they're clear on it. Don't do this or else. <laughs> and so for some people, that's, that's what they like. They like to know, okay? Have you not been in our churches, even as Christians, that sometimes you, you'll be in a Christian church and you're like, why is that guy or why is that girl so worked up about this? And uh, man, they just like, you Christians, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll think that they're the most faithful and a hardcore Christian compared to other Christians. Well, that's a person who likes structure. They like, do this, don't do that. And they, they'll let you know very clearly uh, and by their lifestyle, by their attitude. And there's other Christians like, okay, you don't have to be this, this hardcore about it. And they don't, but that's, that's their personality type. And sometimes personality types like certain types of structure. And you learn that. And that's where the Holy Spirit of God has to work on all of us. <clears throat> whether we're more lackadaisical or we're too over the top on certain things. Another thing is the um, universal brotherhood. Uh, in many of our prisons, Islam has grown exponentially because uh, the ma majority of those who are converting to Islam in prisons, <clears throat> that there's a sense, excuse me, there's a sense that there's power and there's acceptance and there's a brotherhood there the same thing that I saw in the gangs in LA and Chicago. Uh, why did they go to the gangs in LA and Chicago? That was their family. They, they wanted to feel, and they wanted to feel protected. They wanted to feel like there's somebody they can depend on. They want to feel secure. So a lot of uh, young teenage guys and, and, and gals would go to them because they didn't feel like they had a secure home environment. And this was not only acceptance, but it was also if you do me wrong, there's 20 people behind me, they're going to take you out. I mean, they just knew that there was strength in numbers. And I'm not saying that all those who convert to Islam or have that mindset, but it's a big pull to have that brotherhood. Uh, just as we feel with Christians, you ever been in a place where you didn't know if there was a lot of Christians around you, but then when all of a sudden you start finding out, boy, there's more Christians. Boy, you feel, okay, 
Our brothers are here with us. They, they understand us. Yeah, we all feel that way to a point. And so I think that's something else to, to remember that uh, there are people that will uh, convert because they see that there's a, a brotherhood that's involved with this. And so, uh, and there are many other reasons uh, for this, but all right, we're going to wind it down. Our time's just about up here. Uh, any last comments or statements or experience you had of, of trying to witness to someone who is of the Muslim faith? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely, and <clears throat> that's an excellent point. And there's uh, Christian groups that during the month of Ramadan, they will go to Michigan, they will go to New York, they'll go to places where there's large um, uh, religious gatherings and, and just for the purpose of being amongst, as Christians, being amongst uh, Muslims to uh, pass out flyers, pass out tracts, try to talk to them. There are many former Muslims that do this now as ministries, and they've seen great success at bringing people to Christ that earned that because like, like many people before we came to Christ, we just didn't know anything else. But yet there are people out there that are open to conversations that will guide them towards Christ and, uh, and they will be um, more interested in hearing those conversations and, and learning about Christ. So yes, uh, these are great opportunities for us, especially in our own community. Uh, we have many Muslims in our community, whether you know that or not. Many people have different faiths, but don't shy away from talking to them, treating them like normal people. Again, just learn a little bit about their culture, what's, what's expected, what's, um, how to respect them. But at the same time, for the most part, they understand we're Westerners, and if they're here, they're going to give you a little, little more liberty than you would if you were over in another country where the, their laws might be a little more strict. So, all right. Any final thoughts or statements on this? Awesome. So, uh, and I would say with any of these different uh, groups that we've studied, uh, we've got uh, what, one or two more classes to go. Uh, learn about that culture. If you find out you have a coworker that's in uh, part of a different type of faith, <clears throat> learn about their faith a little bit so that way you can be more accurate in your questions to really see where they're at and just see if they're interested in, in having a dialogue. Never be condescending, never be critical or say something like, well, that's just silly or that's just stupid. Well, you're just going to shut down the opportunities you're going to have. So learn to be more open, but then knowing your position too. And if they ask you about your faith, be very open about it. That, yeah, this is what I believe and here's why I believe it. And, and uh, it just sometimes it turns into good conversations. Nobody's mad. Nobody's arguing or fighting. Just, okay, that's your belief. That's my belief. But that can be a seed to, to get in the door for more opportunities. Uh, treating their families with respect is huge in many of these cultures. If you treat their kids or you treat their family in a, in a way that's uh, kind, uh, they might return that to you more than you realize because that's just something they, they deeply appreciate. And so uh, I would say not, not for purposes of conversion, but just look for ways of, of being kind and gracious to people just as you know, neighborly, but uh, that may open the door for you to have more conversations or to know, hey, there's a Christian that actually understands, you know, about how to live for Christ. And we'd rather see them have more of those uh, interactions than, sadly, what some of them see. You crazy jihadists, what are you doing, you know, in my neighborhood? Okay, 
they, they're probably not that at all. That's the furthest thing from their mind. But because their skin tone or the way they dress looks like that, what you saw on TV, if you treat them that way, you're going to miss out uh, on the blessing of having probably one of the best neighbors you ever had, even if you don't agree on uh, theology. So uh, don't be scared to, to befriend people and to uh, treat them with respect and then learn about their culture because that's the greatest way you're going to have inroads with them. All right, we'll wind it down right there. Any uh, special prayer requests before we, we end tonight? I know I mentioned earlier um, those that I did, we prayed. Anyone else?